military has carried out an apparent coup against President Robert Mugabe. This is not a military takeover. Jubilation across the country that Robert Mugabe ruled for 37 years. It feels like a revolution. I, Emerson Nangawa, defend the constitution of Zimbabwe. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. Here are some of the media stories we've been tracking this week. Zimbabwe, 37 years in power, ends in a week of confusion. We examine the coverage of Robert Mugabe's downfall. Uganda's president has been in office for a mere 31 years. Journalists there are more and more fearful of the police. In India, a yet-to-be-released Bollywood epic has sparked protests and led a politician to place a bounty on the heads of the filmmakers. And Mnuchin, Steve Mnuchin, playing the Bond villain for all it's worth. With the raising of a hand and the taking of an oath, Zimbabwe got a new president and the international news media lost a bogeyman. Emerson Munangagwa is in, Robert Mugabe is out. The transition began when tanks rolled onto the streets and a man in a military uniform appeared at the anchor desk of the state-owned television channel assuring everyone that what looked, sounded and smelled like a coup was in fact not a coup. The army was clearly calling the shots, but the 93-year-old head of state seemed to stray from the script during a live televised speech in which he failed to deliver the resignation that many had expected. 48 hours later, though, that resignation became official. The preceding power struggle had lasted seven days, and it caught Zimbabweans, their media included, by surprise. For a while there, journalists, many of whom have spent decades preserving Mugabe's unimpeachable integrity, weren't really sure where the story was going and more to the point, who they were taking their orders from. Our starting point this week is the capital, Harare. Behind the story of what happened in Zimbabwe this past week lies a significant media story that has gone largely unreported. One of the reasons armored vehicles rolled onto the streets of Harare that day. Hello, Zimbabweans and the general took to the airwaves that night, may have been that the day before, the Zimbabwean military held a press conference expressing concern over the state of the country's democracy, the hijacking of its government. That story was ignored. Not a word of it was reported by the state-owned newspaper or state-controlled broadcaster loyal to Robert Mugabe. For the generals who tried to send a message the conventional way, through the news media, only to be thwarted, that may have been the last straw. This press statement was not covered at the time by the Herald and the Zim or the Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation. However, it did circulate on social media through WhatsApp, through Facebook, it was uploaded onto YouTube. And then for the following day, images of tanks rolling into Harare were also circulated uh, via social media and only the early hours of the Wednesday morning. Our main broadcaster, Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation, and the Herald were directed not to publicize the situation in our country. Um, did uh, ZBC decide to broadcast um, a televised address where another army general um, was uh, addressing the nation, of course, also covered widely in the international media. Over the next 48 hours, even state-owned news outlets could no longer ignore the obvious, at least not for long. But spare a thought for the editors in charge of The Herald and ZBC TV. For almost four decades, those outlets were dedicated to propping up a Mugabe government. Is it a coup or not a coup? In the space of a couple of days, the rules changed. Now what do you do? The state-owned uh, Herald newspaper found itself in the unenviable position of having uh, uh, a front page story denouncing the generals um, after their press conference. I think the paper was published at midnight. So in the morning they had to produce another special edition with a completely different message um, praising the military interventions. Uh, it was a spectacular U-turn. The very same guys who are running with this copy, who are running with this story, this story are the very same protagonists who were working with Mugabe. Now they are made to report on the developments of the very same person. They don't have this enthusiasm in terms of reportage. And it may be it's, it emanates from denial, it emanates from fear of the unknown. 
Yeah. And it's probably shocking for a lot of Zimbabweans watching ZBC now. And you're like, wait a minute. For the past 37 years, you, the same broadcaster, you have been singing this, this, this man's praises. At what point did you suddenly realize that Mugabe is 93? Uh, you, you can't be telling me those in the state media realized Mugabe was 93 this week. A lot of people in the state media simply go with the flow. Wherever the, the, the water is flowing to, that's where, that's where you find them. Four days after the military stepped in, Zimbabweans heard from Robert Mugabe for the first time. Knowing his speech was coming, many Western media outlets, citing anonymous sources, sent out news alerts of a pending resignation. They would be proven wrong. The choreography of the televised speech was telling. Among the military men looming behind the president was Constantino Chiwenga, the same general who had placed him under house arrest. So the event started with an interesting announcement. Hello and welcome to President Robert Mugabe's address to the nation. Like State we were about to watch a Hollywood tonight. movie. So sit back, uh, relax and... Then uh, switch to the footage of Mugabe sitting in the room surrounded by the army generals. And it was a bit unclear whether uh, Mugabe had just um, changed his speech or whether there was some something fishy going on there with the speech. And we had that bizarre situation where the army general had an eagle eye looking at what Mugabe was reading. Mugabe appeared to miss a page and the general was kind of like trying to nicely tell him that you skipped something. It's a long speech. People are still debating, did he say long speech or wrong speech? Um, so the theory was that they tried to switch speeches and give him a speech where he was resigning or that he was meant to resign and simply skipped the page where he was supposed to, to resign. If the president would have done that, resigning surrounded by men in uniforms, uh, it would simply be again perceived as a coup, which is the last thing that in the establishment in Zimbabwe done to hear or talk about. In this game, President Robert Mugabe has been outwitted, so the military were ahead of everyone, including the media itself. From the moment Robert Mugabe's resignation became official, the pictures driving the coverage of the story looked like this, celebratory. But should that be the case, his successor, Emerson Munangagwa, is not exactly a fresh face, free of baggage. As Mugabe's former head of national security, he takes office with a reputation for crushing dissent. Then there's the military. Having entered the political fray and intervened once, how long will the generals be willing to remain on the sidelines? For all the coverage of Zimbabwe, inside the country and out, plenty of stories are going untold, including what lies ahead for the media there. It's been very problematic for the international media to reduce the Zimbabwe story to the actions of one individual. Um, the picture is more complex. It wasn't just um, the achievements of Mandela that uh, freed up uh, South Africa. And it wasn't only the actions of Mugabe that supposedly destroyed Zimbabwe. We need to look at power relations between the different parties within factions, uh, within the party. The story is about the future. Mugabe is past. What is it going to be like the civilian uh, military relations going forward? How is the post-Mugabe scenario going to be a desirable alternative if ZANPF the product of Robert Mugabe is still in charge of the events. ZANU-PF is still in charge. This is the equivalent of a snake that has simply shed its skin because we, we have no idea, as I'm doing this interview, who the new information minister is going to be, whether the oppressive laws like the Access to Information and Protection of Privacy Act that has been used to muzzle the media in Zimbabwe. We don't know whether that is going to be scrapped. So, like many are saying, a tyrant has been removed, but has the tyranny gone? For Zimbabweans leery of being overly reliant on state media for their news and information, more and more alternative sources have presented themselves in recent years, most of them accessible on mobile phones.
263 Chat is a news service. It gets its name from Zimbabwe's telephone country code. It's a website with a weekly newsletter delivered via its WhatsApp group. Founded in 2012 by a former accountant, Nigel Mugamu, 263 Chat has almost a quarter of a million followers on Twitter, more than almost all of the country's mainstream outlets. Open Parley is a politics website set up by the Magamba Network, an activist collective trying to open up democratic space in Zimbabwe. The site provides real-time coverage, including Facebook live streams of parliamentary proceedings and breaking news updates on Twitter. And on the airwaves, as well as online, is the podcast Politics and Beyond. It's broadcast on a privately owned radio station called Capital 26 Free. The show's hosts analyze news events and interview politicians from all parties, including those who don't usually find platforms elsewhere. Other media stories that are on our radar this week, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission's plan to repeal net neutrality laws has critics warning this could be the end of the Internet as we know it. Net neutrality is the idea that all Internet content should be free from interference by the middlemen, broadband providers. The current rules prevent American firms like Verizon and AT&T arbitrarily blocking or slowing access to certain sites and charging others for access to a premium fast lane. The FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, was appointed by President Trump. He says lifting these regulations will encourage broadband providers to invest in expanding their networks. Internet companies and experts alike have condemned the plans, with Pai's predecessor at the FCC calling it a sham and a sellout. The FCC vote in three weeks' time looks certain to pass, with Republicans on the commission outnumbering Democrats. But net neutrality campaigners are saying they won't give up the fight. The tussle that has the U.S. government and its tech companies in one corner and Russia in the other escalated this past week. Eric Schmidt of Google's parent company Alphabet Inc. announced that Google was reducing the prominence of RT and Sputnik, news outlets funded by the Kremlin in its search engines, to curb, quote, misleading and exploitative content. Russia's media regulator Roskomnadzor immediately responded with a letter seeking clarification and raising the prospect of retaliation. The U.S. Congress is investigating allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election, and some U.S. tech companies have been accused of rolling over for Russian media providers and social media propagandists. Last month, the Department of Justice in Washington forced RT to register as a foreign agent in order to continue broadcasting in the U.S., which the Russian parliament followed by passing a law allowing its own government to do the same with foreign media in Russia. In a separate move late last month, Twitter banned RT from advertising on its platform. In India, the imminent release of a Bollywood film, an historical epic, has provoked an extraordinarily hostile response with a politician calling for the heads of the director and lead actress involved. Padmavati tells the 14th century story of a fictional Hindu queen from the Rajput caste and a Muslim king. Rumors of a romantic scene involving the two outraged many Rajputs and other Hindus who want the film banned. The filmmakers insist there is no such scene, and they've been backed up by several journalists who have actually seen the film. Nevertheless, a Rajput caste association has held demonstrations. Protesters have burned effigies of the director Sanjay Leela Bansali and vandalized cinemas showing the trailer. A media coordinator for the ruling BJP party in Haryana, Suraj Palamu, went further. He offered a reward of more than a million dollars for the beheading of the director and lead actress, Deepika Padukone. Police in Haryana say they've booked Amu under Section 506 of the Indian Penal Code. Criminal intimidation, the maximum sentence for that is seven years in prison. Having been in power for more than 37 years, Robert Mugabe was Africa's third longest serving leader. Number four on that list at 31 and a half years is the president of Uganda, Yoweri Museveni. In his early days in office, Museveni oversaw the opening up of the country's media space, the arrival of many new news outlets, both broadcast and print. However, the 73-year-old has clearly grown less tolerant of a free press. His government has passed some problematic laws that have had a chilling effect on reporting. Ugandan journalists have long faced political intimidation and harassment. However, over the past few years, some things have changed. And now the people reporters in Uganda tend to fear the most wear police uniforms. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now from Kampala 
on media laws and the way they are enforced when journalism in Uganda crosses paths with policing. On the surface, the media in Uganda looks vibrant. Dozens of papers populate the newsstands. There are numerous news channels on TV and some 240 radio stations on the dial. Ugandans can also get online with relative ease. However, speak to journalists here and many will tell you that reporting the news can be risky and a police presence is often not a reassurance, but a threat. Journalists have been the female police officers beat us while the male officers enjoyed fondling our breasts. This policewoman charged against a female journalist while everyone looked on. I went to see Andrew Luanga, a journalist who was assaulted by a senior policeman while covering a protest in 2015, an attack he says has left him with permanent injuries. On January 12, 2015, you went out to cover a group of young Ugandans who were protesting against unemployment in the country. Uh, what happened next? Two leaders of the youth were arrested. I happened to be behind. I was filming the arrest. He saw me. He got his cable. Hit me first. He hit me the second time. The third uh, came, came in. I put the camera, he hit it. It was so strong, it broke the LCD. The camera that was in um, parts. So he hit me, then I blacked out. Once attacked, we were, of course, was rushed to hospital. Though he was briefly um, arrested by the police and they wanted to put him in the cells in that state of uh, health, in a very deteriorating state. We went to the hospital to ask the medical team at the hospital, our National Referral Hospital, to give due attention to this guy. But then the guy was discharged and in a very pathetic healthy state. And the next day when he came over to the police to record a statement, he collapsed. I was admitted in Zambia Hospital, but I woke up, up, up uh, after three or four days. On waking up on the fourth day, I could not feel myself. I could not feel from the west up to the legs. I could not stand. I was in Zambia uh, for about um, 27 days. The day after the assault, a group of Ugandan journalists and media activists organized a protest march. As they neared police headquarters in central Kampala, they were blocked by police, pepper sprayed and arrested. Overwhelming evidence of the assault on Luwanga by District Police Commander Jerome Masije got him suspended and charged. Two years later, in a case fraught with delays, irregularities and claims of witness intimidation, Masije was found guilty of assault. He was dismissed from the force and fined a nominal 1,400 US dollars. Luanga says that his medical bills have come in at around $60,000. We spoke with Asan Kasinja, the Assistant Inspector General of Police. He says that his force has taken the appropriate action, even if the courts have not. Let's contextualize this very well. This officer was arrested by the police. The DPP advised the police on which charges to charge him. And he was taken to courts. So if courts of law gave a punishment that in public opinion, it's not what he could have done, we have nothing to do about that. That was not the police. And we should not be judged for what courts of law in their wisdom did. But for us, we said, even if courts of law have made this kind of judgment, this officer cannot work in the police. We wanted a, a message to go out to the other police officers and security agents who have since made it a habit to you know, descend onto journalists, beat them, block them from accessing news. We wanted to just make that point very strong. We, we didn't achieve that. And it's not the only case. Why we are referring to it is because he was courageous enough to go to court. But there are so many journalists that have been beaten out of police brutality, beating, kicking. And the police is not just beating journalists. They are beating citizens. 
Musidja is one of the only police officers to have been convicted of assaulting a journalist, despite the alarming frequency with which it happens. According to a report released by the Human Rights Network for Journalists in Uganda, the HRNJU, the security forces, especially the police, are the worst offenders against media freedoms. Of the 135 violations against journalists last year, 83 were committed by the Ugandan police. That's more than 60%. The police have consistently been the worst perpetrators of violence against the media in Uganda. What the HRNJU's findings show is that over the past four years there's been a spike in police aggression and that should come as no surprise because exactly four years ago a controversial new law was passed called the Public Order Management Act that many here warned would put the opposition, activists, protesters and journalists on a collision course with the authorities. The roots of the Public Order Management Act, or POMA, can be traced back to 2011. As the Arab Spring unfolded with uprisings across the Middle East and North Africa, authorities in Kampala made moves to bolster legislation that would ostensibly help them maintain order. In practice, it would seem, they were creating a legal framework to crack down on dissent. Under POMA, if five or more Ugandans want to form any kind of political assembly, then they need police permission to do so which opposition members will tell you is hard to come by. As a consequence, police are breaking up more and more gatherings of a political nature, like a handful of Ugandan youths protesting against unemployment. And when journalists turn up to cover the story, then all too often, and through no choice of their own, they become part of the story. We know the spirit behind the particular law was to phase out uh, critical voices, was to deny space to the opposition and all critical minds here in Uganda. The media is the last man standing to uh, give a platform to those that are not allowed to assemble, uh, to associate and to express themselves through public forums and meetings, which media now is being arm twisted to discuss things in a particular uh, way that tends to be friendly. To, to the regime. They've already stopped opposition, they've already beaten media, they've already beaten people, citizens who are standing up for their rights, but they had no legal basis. So the Public Order Management Act was passed to create a basis for the bad acts of government. But also it's important to underscore the fact that POMA is being implemented alongside other draconian laws. The Communications Act, the Media Freedoms Act, the Cyber Crimes Act. So it is not just POMA that is used. The media, journalists, have already determined, for example, if it is a political contestation, they are already biased. You can tell whether it is a terrare, whether it is by writing, whether it is expressing a point on TV. And once you have, or the police think that you are somebody from that kind of perspective, there's going to be a problem. That a perceived media bias forms any kind of justification for police brutality is the problem. And it demonstrates that too many uniforms in Uganda are there to serve those in power and not the people. And here is just one outcome. Andrew Luwanga is now forced to live at home with his retired mother. The journalist struggles to make ends meet and is unlikely to work in the field, if not the profession, ever again. The policeman who assaulted him has walked free. And finally, a couple of weeks back, Donald Trump's Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin took advantage of a photo opportunity, showing himself with a sheet of newly printed $1 bills, the first to feature his own signature. The resulting image went viral, but for the wrong reasons. Someone made the point that Mr. Secretary and his wife resembled a couple of Bond villains, which Mnuchin actually took as a compliment, or at least tried to. And that got one Twitter commentator thinking. Historian Kevin M. Cruz concluded Mnuchin wasn't the only member of the Trump administration with an eerie resemblance to bad guys and bad girls from films featuring Secret Agent 007. We leave you now with a little selection of those, and we'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. <laughs>